Welcome to this Seasonal Vegetable Gardening webinar presented by Contra Costa County Library and the Master Gardener Program of Contra Costa County. We are jumping right in with presenter and Master Gardener Marion Woodard. We hope you learned and enjoy. Thank you. Why is that important? First question, why do you want to garden? Write down that answer later when we have more time, when you have more time. And then what is important about that? And if you can go down two levels for that, it, you, it may be interesting to see how your reason for wanting to grow vegetables or, or, or edibles changes or just gets deeper. First question, why do you want a garden? Second question, how do you want to feel when you're in that space. Lots of answers here, and it may directly go back to your answer to question one. They want to feel peaceful or calm or excited. When a, I'm, I want to experience curiosity. I just, you know, there are all kinds of answers. So why do I ask these two questions which don't seem like they have that much to do with the nuts and bolts of the four basics around gardening? The clearer you get on your intention, the more you can focus your attention. So if you know why you are there, what is really important to you about growing and how you want to feel in while you are in that activity, when you make decisions about what is coming into the garden or what perhaps something maybe needs to leave the garden, does that coming in or going out, does it support you feeling that way and your intention of why you're growing or not. So it just simplifies the decision making process a little bit. It would help if page down actually worked. I am okay, there we go. Sheesh. Once we know why we want to garden and how we want to feel, we come to some basic questions. And the first is, where is your garden physically going to reside? This may seem like an obvious question, but the closer your garden is to the doors you use most frequently, the better off you're going to be and the better off your garden is going to be. If you can pass by your garden going and coming, it's going to be easier for you to see if a plant is ready for harvest. For example, you know, a zucchini that's this big in the morning, we all know what happens to zucchini by the afternoon. You could tell if a plant looks stressed, you could tell if uh, there's a pest problem starting, or you could see a flower that is just so gorgeous you stop dead in your tracks and remember the beauty there is in the world. So the closer it is to the doors you use more, most frequently, the better off it's going to be. Because if your garden's in the back 40, I don't care how excited you are when you first start, that trip is gonna get longer and longer and longer as the season goes on. So get it as close as you can based on the four basics we're gonna be going through. Next up is in what will your plants grow? The pictures that we have on our slide here on the right hand side show various sizes of containers. We can grow a lot in containers and based on the size of your area or where some of your most important elements are, this may be your best option. Also, if you're just starting out, start small. Start with one plant, maybe two. Get some success under your belt and then go on to larger and larger pots and plants. If you've got the space, perhaps you can use raised beds like our picture on the left. Lots of advantages to these and isn't that a gorgeous picture of a series of raised beds. The other option you might have, it's not pictures here, but you may be able to garden in bed, meaning you're using native soil. All answers are good ones. It just depends on your personal variables. In kindergarten, we learn a song whose words are sun, soil, water, and air. Everything we eat and everything we wear comes from sun, soil, water and air. These are our four foundations and we're going to be going over them in a fair amount of detail. 
it all starts with the soil. For so many of us for so long, we have so taken for granted that medium under our feet that actually is responsible for us being here. So what is soil exactly? It is primarily a mixture of minerals. The picture on our left here, we see we've got uh, sand and anyone who's walked on a beach before knows sort of the, the crunchy coarse texture of that. And we can see there's a lot of white space around those particles. They tend to be fairly big. We can generally see them with the naked eye. And when water comes through soil, it just tends to run right through. We have silt. And if those, if you are in the Delta, for example, you may have some of the alluvial uh, decomposition of rocks, which makes up silk. Silt, and it's really silky if you were to put wet, the wet soil in, those, in your hands. And then there's what a lot of us have, which is good old clay. Very packed, small particle size, not a lot of air space in there. But the good news is clay is very nutrient rich, so there are advantages to it. We just have to learn how to work with it. If we look at that triangular diagram on the right hand side, this is, are all the different permutations of how these three minerals come together to make up soil. You'll see that clay is the largest portion of this. Uh, sand is down at the very bottom left and silt is down at the very bottom right. And as the various mixtures come into play, you could plot you, what type of soil you have. Do you wanna know how to do that? Well, on the reference sheet that Andrea mentioned, there will be a link that will tell you how to work with your own soil by doing a uh, feeling and uh, putting some water in it. And there's a couple of fun activities to do, especially if you have kids, it's a really good summertime exercise. But those minerals of silt, sand, and clay are not the only components to soil. If we look under our ideal composition here, we see, yeah, they make up 40 to 45%. And those minerals, again, they're decomposed rocks that have come over the millennia, down through the millennia. They used to be, you know, half dome size, and now they're teeny weeny in, your, in what's underneath your feet. But there's also three other critical components. We're going to need some water in there. We're going to need some air. And we're going to need something called organic matter. Now, organic here does not mean pesticide free. How I wish. Organic here simply means it is or was alive. So it could be decaying leaves. It could be roly polies and worms and earwigs and insect frass. I mean, any type of insect. It could be any animal that has, is breathing no more and is decomposing. So it's all of these things that are that we're on top of the soil and as they degrade, they can enter the soil. The picture on the right-hand side of our page is beginning to suggest this relationship of microbes going around the plant roots. That organic matter is comprised of millions and billions of microbes. This slide alone, we could spend about three hours on. So I'm gonna to try to do it in under a minute. It said that we have as much plant mass below ground as we have above ground. So if you have the ability to look out a window and look at a tree or at a bush, imagine that everything you see above ground, there's that much below. All of those roots, you've got tap roots, you're going deep into the ground. You've got the root fibers and root hairs that are going out horizontally and, horizontally and down. Around every last one of those roots are bacteria, and fungi. The soil is teeming with life. And there's a symbiotic relationship going on that all of those plant roots going down, they are dependent on those bacteria and fungi and nematodes and protozoas and ciliates and amoebas and all of these micro and macroscopic creatures to bring nutrients to the plant. The plants feed the microbes and the microbes are going to go and feed the plant. So every time we move from left to right, so for example, 
the bacteria, and there's good bacteria and bad bacteria, good fungi, bad fungi, good nematodes, bad nematodes. Our job is to get our soil healthy enough so that the good guys, the aerobes, those that need air to live, outnumber the bad guys, the anaerobes, the critters that can live without air. So every time a bacteria or a fungi either dies of ripe old age or gets consumed by a protozoa or a nematode, the, especially if it's getting eaten, those protozoas and nematodes, they can't digest all the nitrogen that's in the bacteria and the fungi. So they have to excrete it, otherwise they're gonna get indigestion. So they let the nitrogen go, which is immediately available to the plant roots. So what this soil food web is showing us is every time something gets eaten by the, the law of the jungle underground, from uh, the fungi get eaten by the nematodes, the nematodes are getting eaten by the bigger nematodes, that are gonna get eaten by the arthropods, that are gonna get eaten by the birds and so forth. Every time somebody gets eaten or something gets eaten, there are nutrients left in the soil. So soil is alive. We need to help the soil because the more life you have in the soil, the healthier your soil is gonna be, the better your plants are gonna be able to grow, the less you're gonna need fertilizers, pesticides, insecticides, minocides, fungicides, and all of those things that cost a lot of money and are really not good for the planet. Impressed on why we need healthy soil? Let's now talk about how we're going to improve it if we don't have the world's best soil right now. Likely you've heard of compost. It's pretty simple. What it is, is again a mixture of just four ingredients. It starts on the left-hand side, as we see, with our brown or our carbon ingredients. Leaves, straw, uh, wood chips, newspaper, sh um, shredded cardboard, um, old cotton underwear and t-shirts that you can't wear anymore. Add that to the greens, the nitrogens, like grass, which has no weed and feed on it, please. Uh, food scraps, uh, vegan, no, no, no oil, no salts, no meat, no bones, uh, mostly uh, fruits and vegetables, and maybe some manures that we will talk about in a little bit. We're gonna mix that up with some water and some air. We're gonna uh, turn it a couple of times, and with any luck at all, what's going to come out is that luscious handful of compost you see on the right hand side that looks fluffy and you can just tell from here it smells awesome it smells like the forest floor it smells earthy and probably if we had the ability to look at that uh, handful if we could spread it out we'd probably see a couple of little creepy crawlies crawling in there and that's good that's life that's our organic matter so that's compost that's one of our options we can also improve our soil using coverings. Mulch is, um, it can be inorganic like a plastic cloth, or it can be organic like you see here. Now, you're wondering why are the stones or pebbles in there? I would not use those if I were using containers or raised beds. If I were trying to create defensible fire space and I were growing fruit trees or nut trees, I may wish to put stones and pebbles around the drip line of the tree, maybe up to a couple of inches away from the trunk because it has enough permeability that water, brain, we could hope, will go down through there and, and nurture the roots. What's not on here that we do use at Rogers Ranch quite successfully is burlap. We have some uh, roasteries here in Contra Costa that bring in big burlap bags full of coffee beans and they can't throw those into the landfill because it will cog up the wheels, the, the cogs, um, so they're very happy to give them away. So if you've got, if you think that burlap bags might work for you, you can cut them and open them up or we just lay them down where, where we've got the room to do so. It's actually an effective mulch. The other cool thing about mulch is it keeps your soil cooler in the summer. It keeps it warmer in the winter. And I can't tell you it's a complete weed suppression system, but at least it slows them down. 
So we like mulch and you got lots of different options. You also can improve your soil with something called cover crops. Cover crops are one or more different types of plants with superpowers. One type is planted to put more nutrition in your soil, and those can be like your beans and your peas, the legumes. They have this amazing ability to basically pull nitrogen out of the air, shunt it down into the roots, so that both the plant roots and all those microbes down there have an essential shot of what they need. The second type of cover crops are the legumes, and I'm sorry, the grains like wheat and oats and barley and rye. And those crops will create a lot of root mass down in your soil. Why would you want that? Well, if you've got sandy soil and you're growing root, uh, a lot of things with root mass, it's gonna create density in your soil. And if you've got clay soil and you plant a rye, rye plants, they can throw off two miles of root hairs per plant per season, two miles. So that's breaking up your clay soil so you don't have to. It's also called cover crops because you're covering the ground enough that you've got a lot of weed suppression. How are you going to use this? You may wish to consider cover crops at the end of a season, like summer season, when you're taking out your tomatoes and your eggplant and your cucumbers and your corn. All of those crops that take a lot of nutrients out of the soil are gonna need to be replenished. Cover crops are a great way to do this. If you didn't have a great crop last season and you'd like to turbocharge your soil before you start planting again, put in some cover crops. The other option is you're just tired and you don't want to garden this season, but in some cover crops. How are you going to get rid of them when it's time to, to take them out? You're actually not going to take them out. Two or three weeks before you want that ground to work in again, you're going to go and cut them off at ground level. Only with noxious weeds do we pull plants out by the roots. All the other plants like cover crops, we want to leave the roots in the ground so all of those microbes we just talked about have food and nutrition until your next crop gets established. So let those microbes do the work for you. Cover crops, great way to do it. And you can also read here that there are several other advantages to using cover crops. What type of cover crops am I talking about? It will depend on the season. Right now, we're recording this in July. You may wish to, if you've got some extra ground or you need to turbocharge uh, your soil, go with some buckwheat, which is that white flower that you see, or cow peas. Black eyed peas are probably the most commonly known cow peas. That's a bush, that's fine. If you can get your hands on some Red Ripper cow peas, they will run. Uh, great for covering the soil. And uh, advantage of this is you get to eat the pods. They're really good or the, pea, the peas in the pod. If you're moving into cool season, try one of these five. Austrian field peas are actually what the hand has is showing you. And we love to grow these both at the ranch and at El Monte because the kids have something to eat all winter long. Each one of those leaves, each one of those tendrils is going to taste like a fresh pea. And they're hardy to 15 below. I think we're covered. Again, their annual ryegrass, sloughing off all those root hairs. Fava beans, great for the soil, great biomass, um, and we kind of love to eat those as well. Clover and vetch are some of the first flowers out in the spring, so the bees are going to have something to eat fairly soon, and both of them are nitrogen fixing. So look up cover crops. They're a great, easy way to help your soil a lot. Up to this point, we've been talking about what to do for and to your soil. This side, we're going to talk about maybe what not to do. Tilling, rototilling. It has been so popular for so long and it does work for a while. Think back to that slide of our soil, our foil, <laughs> soil food web about the plant roots have the bacteria and the fungi that get eaten by the nematodes and the protozoa and all the way up. In 
each level of soil, every inch or so, there are species, different species with different functions that are interacting with each other, but there's layer upon layer upon layer of communication and nutrient channels in the soil. When we come through with a rototiller, we are blending that to high heaven, throwing it up in the air. You get to introduce all kinds of weed seeds that may not have seen the light of day for years that may now sprout on your ground. But you just killed all of those billions and trillions of microbes that exist to help your soil. Why does it work so well after tilling? Why does your crop do so great? Well, all those bodies are decomposing and you got a lot of nutrient load in the soil for a while. Maybe you get a year out of it, maybe a year and a half. But after that, your yield, you notice your yields are starting to drop off and you start eyeing the fertilizer section at the store. And once you do that, uh, you've opened Pandora's box and let's just say, please don't till unless you have to. Now, at Rogers Ranch in 2012 when we started, not only do we have a, did we have a do we have adobe clay soil, but nothing had been on that ground other than tractors at trying to kill the weeds. The soil was so hard, we it took us eight hours to double dig one of the beds. The two volunteers that were with us that day never came back. So we ended up getting a shallow tiller, meaning it only just broke up the first six inches of soil. If you have to, I understand, I'm not gonna judge you. Just know if there's any way, another option around the tilling, if you've got at least, a, if you've got a month, you can put some compost down on the ground, put some cardboard on top of it, put some wood chips on top of that and wet it. That's gonna put some moisture in your soil and the earthworms are gonna start doing their magic. You'll be amazed even in a month, what a difference that makes. If you've got the time, try that. So I mentioned double dig. That basically is a method of, with a shovel, of going into the soil and moving the soil forward in chunks. So you're not completely obliterating all the structure that was in the soil. If you do need to till, if you can remediate the soil as soon after as you can. And by that mean, you're gonna to need to re-inoculate, reintroduce as much biology as you can. One of the ways to do that is through worm compost tea, for example. That's outside the purview of our talk tonight, but in the uh, poll that Andrea is gonna give you at the end, we're gonna be asking you what topics you'd like to see, and that will be one of them. All right, that was big. That's a lot about soil. That's the biggest portion that we have tonight. But just as soil is important, so is water. The slide we're looking at is I think of a prairie grass. And you will see that most of the roots are within the top foot of the soil. But look how, look at that tap root. It's going down. The tap root is the main root that's going deep, deep, deep. It also has a lot of side roots that are going down and out. We look at this and we can tell immediately that the soil is gonna need a lot of moisture in it. And we say, water the soil, not the plant. The number one question at the Master Gardener's help desk is, well, how much do I water? How, much, how do I know what's enough? Here's a guideline. I want you to go out into your garden and with your index finger, I want you to stick it in the drip line of your plant. Watch the drip line. The drip line is where the water, if you were to put up uh, some water, a watering can over the plant, where does the water fall on the outside? So it's, gonna, it's the furthest part of the, the leaves, the, at the base of the canopy, off of the canopy, the water falls down, that's the drip line. Stick your finger in the soil. I want you to be able to feel moisture at the tip of your finger. If you do, chances are good you've got enough moisture in the soil. We've got some tips here. 
and that says don't water shallowly. Probably one of the most common beginner uh, findings is, oh my gosh, it takes a lot more water than I ever thought it would. Because if you're standing there with a hose and you're watering for a minute or two, it's like, surely this plant has all the water it needs. Surprise, scrape off some soil, stick your finger in and see how little water actually got absorbed. Plants take, as a rule, especially if they're vegetables, especially if they're in their beginning stages, they need a lot of water. The second tip says don't water late in the day. You can, but, because there are gonna be times when either you can't get to it earlier or the plant's stressed. So you can, but please don't get the leaves wet. Water at soil level. There are several plants that if their leaves go into sunset wet and overnight and stay wet, they can develop some fungal diseases. So just best not to keep the, um, the leaves wet if you can avoid it. And again, you're gonna get, you need to know your soil. If you've got clay soil right now, you probably are already aware that you can't just blast water on the top of it. Because it's saying, I don't think so, because it takes a long time for it to gradually seep in. Whereas sandy soil, you're putting water on it and it just goes and it's like, okay, what else you got? So get to know your soil. When I was going through Master Gardener training uh, back in 2010 and 2011, I always remember the, the teacher said, 80% of the time, the problem is too much or too little water. Poof, amazing. What are some ways that you can water? We've mentioned the hose, and if all you have is one pot or two, maybe that's your best option for right now, because I do want you to start small so that you get some success under your belt. But here are some ways for you to water larger spaces. I can tell you that we are huge fans of inline drip emitters, both at Rogers Ranch, at home, and at El Monte, for the reasons that you can see here. They are easy to install, I can do it and I am seriously not technical. They are easy to repair. My fourth and fifth graders can help me when I, okay, I'm not used to, I'll move to a con right now. They are super easy to cut through because it's just quarter inch tubing with every six inches is what we use. There's going to be a little hole that water comes out of. Uniformity of watering, very easily to do, but especially when you are going through and you're pruning and you're cutting stuff off at, at ground level, easy to snip through, but also super easy to repair. Um, not too expensive to use, so maybe something for you to consider. Here is our mulch word again. What I like about this slide is it graphically shows the extent to which mulch can save us water. If we look at this slide, that blue line is plants went into the ground here on October 10th. For the blue line, the plants went in, nothing else, no, no mulch. Within one week, 70% of the moisture we started with has left the soil. This is nuts. We don't have that kind of water and we don't have I, you may have heard of this little ditty called uh, climate change. It's not just water that's evaporating. Carbon is leaving as well. So if we can get some mulch on top of this, and you can see you've got options, straw, leaf, grass, burlap bags, wood chips, anything. Get mulch on top of your soil. Please don't leave your soil bare. Another thing you'll notice if you were to leave your soil bare is where are all these weeds coming from? Well, weeds are simply nature's paramedics for the soil. They are there to keep the soil from eroding, to keep the soil from compacting, to keep the soil from evaporating, the nutrients in the soil to evaporate. So if you put the mulch on, there's not as much need for nature to put in weeds. So mulch, mulch, mulch. That's a lot. Let's stop here. We've covered our first two basics. Andrea, have you noticed if any questions are coming in we might discuss?
We sure do. We have about a handful of them. Uh, we are, we're going to take a five-minute question break, and if we don't get to all the questions we have in the chat box now, uh, we have a larger question and answer session at the end. So um, we'll start with some of the compost questions. Um, this particular uh, participant has had their compost for a few years, and they're wondering at what point is the microbial action in compost at, the, at its best? At what point does it provide the most benefit? It's a good question because I didn't talk about uh, humus at all. Probably within the first month or two after your compost is finished, you've got the most microbial life because there's still some food in there for them. Hopefully at the end when your compost is finished, how do you know it's finished? You can't identify any of the initial ingredients. It smells great. Um, it's light and fluffy and crumbly in your hand. Um, hopefully you're going to keep it moist after it's finished because, again, everything's going to need the water to live. After a couple of months, it's still valuable, but it's valuable at this point as a soil amendment, not as much as an inoculant because you don't have the microbial load anymore. Um, can you rehabilitate it? You absolutely can. Um, it's a little bit outside the scope of this presentation, but know that it's still valuable, absolutely keep it, go ahead and work it into your soil. But if you have started some new compost, if you could work that into the soil, or if you're doing vermicomposting, worm composting, uh, make a, a root, uh, make an extract of that and put it into your compost. An extract just basically means you are putting more compost or uh, worm compost in a bag uh, like a pantyhose or a 400 micron bag, putting in a, a five gallon a bucket of water and dunking it up and down for about five minutes and then pouring that into your compost. That will actually in, reintroduce some microbial life into it and it will kickstart your compost again. Great, thank you, Marianne. The next couple questions are about cover crops. Um, one person in particular um, is has a question about white clover. Um, Two-part question, is it invasive? And also, is it a good source of nitrogen for my garden? To my knowledge, all clovers are nitrogen fixing. And if any of you master gardeners on the line know more about this than I do, I am so happy to, to share the microphone with you. Can it be invasive? Um, it could be. And we have had some cover crops at Rogers Ranch that we let go their full uh, from seed to senescence, meaning the, the whole life cycle. And now we have those plants all over the place. And most of the ones like buckwheat, anytime I see a buckwheat pop up, I'm saying thank you. It's got a lot of benefits to the, the soil and it's a beneficial insect attractant. What we end up doing, what the, okay, here's, here's perfect. It would not be invasive if before it goes past flower and to seed, you cut it down. And cover crops are to be, usually they're cut down. They're grown for the soil health. They're generally not grown for human consumption uh, or for human harvesting. So you cut them down before they've reached their full size and gone through their entire life cycle. If you are doing that, they will, I, to my knowledge, they will not be invasive. Great, okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna just shoot two quick questions on mulch and then we'll get some of the rest for the end. Okay. Two about mulch. The first one is, is mulch good to put in containers if you're doing container planting? And also, is it okay to use commercially purchased wood chips? Is that okay? Good question. Yeah. Yeah, good questions both. Is it okay to use mulch in containers? Absolutely. Now, it also depends on how big the container is. For my uh, Cara Cara orange and Meyer lemon and blueberries that I have in half barrel containers, I do have mulch in there of wood chips. Actually, pine needles are better for the blueberries because they want a more acidic environment. Um, is, it, is it good to buy or uh, obtain wood chips, uh, commercially purchased uh, wood chips. It's good if you can ask the 
ask where the wood chips came from. At Rogers Ranch, we get wood chips dropped off 20 cubic yards at a time or a full dump truck. And we always ask, what type of tree is it? Why was it cut down? So it does bear goodness to ask questions. So the, the more you know about the source of anything going into your garden, the better off you will be. Very well said. Very good. So we have a couple questions more. Thank you. Keep them coming. We're making note of them. We have a larger question and answer at the end. And I'm going to go ahead and um, let Mary get back to the rest of her presentation. We've studied soil. We've studied water. Now we need to look about air. I mean, who knew air was so important to have in the soil as well as above ground? What I like about this slide on the right is this is of sand, and we know that sand is a large particle, and therefore it uh, has very uneven surfaces, so there can be a lot of air space around it. The more air space you have, of course, the easier water can move through it, which is uh, pretty important. Um, also, all of those microbes that we've already talked about, all those bacteria and all of those fungi, every last one of those microscopic creatures is inhaling, exhaling, inhaling, exhaling, inhaling, exhaling, just like you and I do. The dark uh, colors that you see around those sand grains, those are aggregates of bacteria. The aggregates are very sticky. That's what holds the sand grains together. It's what holds clay together. It's what holds silt together. So every one of those little black spots that we see is a compendium, a consortium of millions of bacteria all breathing. So if all of those critters down there that we can and cannot see need air, we must have air in the soil. Not to mention the fact your roots down there, they're sort of, it's, it's, at the risk of, I guess it's anthropomorphizing it a little bit, but to say, yeah, they're exhaling and they're inhaling and because they're shooting nutrients out and they're bringing stuff in. So they need to breathe also. So we're really fond of air down there. And doesn't it just make sense that if you've got some air in your soil, it's going to be looser. So your roots are gonna be able to make their way more gently into that deep soil. And of course, the, your soil is going to be more resilient. So it's going to improve your yield and the other wonderful uh, captions that you can read there. How are we going to ensure that we keep some air in the soil? Well, there are two things not to do that are pretty helpful. One is if you have in bed or raised beds, Please don't walk in them. Even if you're leaning in to harvest, transplant, uh, cut off at ground level, if you need to be putting all of your weight on your hand, if you can get a, a board or a block or something that will disperse your weight, the soil would be less compacted. And also, we want to make sure that we don't overwater because the best way to, the fastest way I know of, other than stepping on the soil, to make the air leave the soil is to overwater it. The water will push the air out. Andrea, we got a poll? We do, we have poll number two. We are getting okay. close to our section where we're gonna start talking about some things that's relating to growing edibles. Um, so I'm gonna launch our second poll. If you hold, give me a second. And here is our question. If you could just pick the one that applies for you. How long have you been growing edibles? We're curious to know. Um, so we make sure we provide the right level of information. Have you been growing for one year or less, two to five years, or six or more years? We'll give you guys, your answers are coming in. And while you guys are clicking on, we did um, our Alameda and Contra Costa um, UC advisor, Dawn, um, has um, kind of provided some more information about the white clover. She did say that white clover can spread by rhizomes or stolen, so it does have the potential to spread to unwanted areas, even when it's not in flower. 
So there's some additional info on that white clover question. Thank you, Dawn. Okay, I think all that have voted want to, I'm gonna end the poll. I'm gonna share the results. Wow. So we've got an experienced bunch here. Over half of you, 52%, have been gardening six plus years. That's wonderful. Uh, a quarter of you have been gardening two to five years and 23%, uh, almost another quarter have been um, a year or less. We've got a pretty good mix. Lots of experienced folks. Yeah, I'm, I'm wow. That's why we do these polls, who knew? Yes, it's fun to kind of learn a little bit about you without seeing all of your faces. Um, so I'm going to end that poll and we're going to get into the last component of the four gardening must-haves. Go ahead, Marian. Okay. Which would be the sun. The animal kingdom and the plant kingdom uh, share a fair number of similarities in that we all need sun, soil, water, and air, but plants have a leg up on us from the standpoint that they can make their own food. And it's pretty cool because not only through photosynthesis can plants make the food that they need, but they make more than they need so that they can also help feed the microbes down under in, the, in their root area. You've heard these uh, descriptions of full sun, half sun, part sun, and shade. And you may think, you know, I've lived in this property forever, so I really know my sun. Well, part of what I'd ask you to do is spend some time in your garden now, or to actually tomorrow, or over the weekend. Because you'd be amazed, especially if you've been in your property for a while, did the neighbor plant a tree? Did the neighbor take down a tree? Are there new bushes? Is something casting shadow that didn't used to, or was something not casting, did it used to be clear, and now it is casting shadow. If you can go out into your garden at least four times a year uh, on the equinoxes and the solstices, and uh, from like 8 a.m. until nearly sunset, and just note where the sun is, where are the shadows? Because if you're, depending on what you want to grow, you're going to be using one of these four definitions. You're going to be, when you go to the store to buy a plant and you're reading the plant descriptor stake, it will have one of these four uh, descriptors on it and you need to know what those are. So since we're talking about edibles, about vegetables, let's look and see what type of food, well, what type of vegetable needs what type of sun. We start in our current season. We are now growing our summer vegetables and we know they like warm temperatures and we know they need a lot of sun. And if we look at this list, we notice that botanically speaking, we're talking about fruits, meaning that they have seeds. The fruits are the, uh, and seeds are the penult the penultimate and the ultimate parts of the plant. So when we go over our six plant parts, which of course you know are roots, stems, leaves, flowers, fruits, and seeds. The fruits and seeds need the longest amount of time to come to fruition. Therefore, they need the most amount of sun. So these are our warm season. When we start to move into the root vegetables and to the cooler season vegetables, we see that they start needing less sun, four to six hours a day. As our days get the, the shortest, we notice we move into the leafy vegetables. And what's wonderful about most of these is they're cut and come again. We can harvest and harvest and harvest and harvest. The two hours a day may be a bit optimistic, but uh, four hours a day of sun, I would feel pretty comfortable uh, recommending all of those vegetables. Now there is such thing as too much sun. Not only do we have heat waves, we have incredibly strong ultraviolet light. What I recommend, especially if you have a southern and western exposure, 
and you notice that maybe it looks like your uh, cucumbers or your peppers or your tomatoes are starting to look a little sunburnt. Um, they're developing sort of bald patches on them, discolored patches. That's probably sun scald. And one of the easiest ways to get rid of them is to deploy some shade cloth. So we've got two examples of shade cloth on here. And what I like about the first picture is notice that it's up above the plants. It doesn't have to be pretty. It just happens to be, it just happens, it needs to be there. So um, you can buy shade cloth pretty much wherever plants are sold. It comes in varying percentages of how much uh, shade, how much sun is it going to block? You may find a 37% shade cloth or a 43% shade cloth or a 58% shade cloth. We tend to use about the 34 to 37%, but any shade cloth is gonna be better than none if you find that your vegetables are frying. Uh, you can just drape it over the plants if you want, but again, if you can raise it up enough so you've got some airflow coming through the shade cloth, um, it will, your, your vegetables will say thank you and you'll have a better harvest. But know that if you already have some sun scald on your vegetables, just cut it off and keep going. The rest of the vegetables should be fine. We did it, sun, soil, water, and air. Now let's go into some other suggestions that may help your garden thrive. We here in Contra Costa County live in only one of five Mediterranean climates in the entire world. That means we can grow year round. And what this chart is showing you is just how much we can grow year round. The green is going to be indicative of when you can start the seeds. Sort of the yellow um, is in the harvesting stage and or growing stage and the red's going to be in the harvesting stage. So you can see we've got something going pretty much all year round. You'll notice there's nothing in the January and the December columns here and it's not completely correct for us but I can give you a tip that you want your winter or your fall vegetables in before the period of Persephone, which means that we approach, we are in fewer than 10 hours of daylight. There's a beautiful myth, if you Google the period of Persephone, especially if, if you have kids, it's a wonderful uh, legend to read. And it, it, it always amazes me how people, before they had science, needed to make up stories about why stuff doesn't grow or why, phenomenon was. So that's a that's just a, a story near and dear to my heart. But notice that it says here many, many winter vegetables can be planted twice a year and that leads us to succession planting. Maybe one of your reasons at the very first of this presentation was, you know, I want to grow garlic because I'm tired of playing, paying two dollars for a little sprig at the grocery store. Grow, um, I mean, did I say, I meant to say basil. If I didn't say basil, I meant, meant to say basil. Um, so plant basil seeds like every two or three weeks through the spring and summer. So you always have a crop. And of course, if you get too much, you make pesto. So uh, know that you can plant a lot. You will be faced with the question of, well, should I start from seed or should I just go buy the plant? There are pros and cons to both of these. If you haven't already ordered a seed catalog, by all means do. It's awesome to look to see how, I mean, we, we right now at Rogers Ranch have 19 different types of basil planted. That's not all of them. That's just the 19 that we had, that we got out of one seed catalog. You get to see all that exists. And if you order it from seed, you get to grow that. They're less expensive. I mean, you can get a, a seed package of kale for $4. And it's got like a thousand seeds in it, uh, which reminds me, if you can share seeds with your neighbors, get together and figure out, you know what, I'm going to order kale seeds. You order lettuce seeds because who needs a thousand kale seeds? Switch, share, share the bounty. I never get tired of watching a seed break through the soil and sprout. It's just, it's one of the magics of life to me. Conversely, growing from seed can be tricky. It can be, take slower. I mean, parsley takes like 21 days to germinate. That's a lot of time to stare at a little blank piece of soil going, please grow. 
So you may want to go to seedlings, go to the, to the store. You are going to have fewer choices. They are going to be more expensive because somebody has had to plant sit that since it was a seed. But by George, you get to choose exactly which one you want. It's immediate gratification and you can come home and generally they're ready to transplant. So pros and cons on both of those. As you are planting your and planning and planting your garden, please do remember our friends that provide most of the food for us to eat through pollination. They are having a hard time and they will gladly give us their services in exchange for some healthy habitat. One easy way to do this is especially if you're, uh, actually it doesn't matter if it's herbs or vegetables, let some of your plants go past what you would choose to eat and let them go to flower, let them go to seed. Now, if you are buying flowers or seeds for pollination, please be aware that you want open pollinated seeds, you want open pollinated plants. You don't want hybrids because the hybrids don't have enough of the pollen or the nectar flow for our insects to make it worth their while to come in. They may, they may try to get some, but it's the, the nutritional load is not there for them. So open pollinated, lots and lots and lots to choose from. Okay, last really big slide. We've said, well, I think we said, if the soil is not healthy, the plants are not healthy. And if the plants are not healthy, we're not healthy. So what can we add? We talked about compost, we talked about cover crops, we talked about not tilling. What else can we do? If you go to a plant store, you're going to see a wall full of boxes and bags. They're going to have all these different uh, ingredients in them. If you, please read the label. If what you pick up looks like it came out of a chemistry lab, consider putting it back. The synthetic fertilizers are chemical salt based. They are there to feed the plants. And we know now that we need to feed the soil. We don't need to feed the plants, but it's an immediate boom. Of course, if you are adding a synthetic fertilizer, it can make your plant go really fast, but if they are not applied really carefully, the salts can build up in the soil and they can actually leach into the water table. On the other hand, if you are looking at the bags that are say soil food and they have ingredients in them that you can identify, kelp, bat guano, uh, fish meal, um, cottonseed meal. Those are going to be a better bet because they're feeding the soil, feeding the microbes that will feed your plant roots. Last up is manure. Sort of a rule of thumb is if the manure is coming from an herbivore, like a guinea pig or a bunny, you can put those manures straight on into the soil. If it's horse manure, you need to ask questions. What has the horse been eating? When was the last time it was dewormed? As a rule, I like to compost all of my big animal manures, uh, very much so horse. Steer manure tends to have a lot of salt in it. So may want to, uh, it got a lot of nitrogen in it, yay go team, but may want to cut back, uh, we don't want that much salt in the soil. Dairy cow manure, on the other hand, seems to be okay. A chicken manure, compost it. It's hot, meaning it's, uh, it smells really strong, uh, and that means it's not decomposed yet. So just go ahead and compost it. But bottom line, if you're buying something at the store, read the label. If you don't recognize what's in it, ask. And the more you can recognize what's in it, I think the happier your soil is going to be. Last up, tools. Use the best tools that you can. I can't tell you how many $2 trowels, which is that uh, handheld shovel thing in the very bottom there, we've bought. And if you're, especially if you're digging in clay soil, that $2 plastic trowel is not gonna last a long time. There's a little bit of scale difference here. So I wanted to show you one of my favorite tools is the Hori Hori. It is 
I don't know, about 10 inches wide. It's got a serrated edge. It's got a, a sharp edge here. It's heavy enough that if I need to, I can use it as a hammer. It's uh, great for digging out uh, weeds or roots if I need to. It can go into fairly skinny spaces. So it's just a, a nice tool that I enjoy using. But other than that, you don't need a ton of tools. A good shovel, a good spading fork, which is what that fork is. It's got the four tines on it. Maybe a steel rake. And you see our little tiller over there on the right that's got the, the X through it. If you must till, again, see if you can borrow it, see if you can uh, uh, rent one, because I'd so much prefer you spend your money on seeds and plants and things that make you and your garden really happy. Well, we did it. Sun, soil, water, and air. I hope as we've gone through this presentation, you're thinking about your garden. What of these elements do you have? Maybe do things need to be shifted around a little bit? If you have questions after this, uh, you can of course contact the Master Gardener Help Desk. I think they're operating through email right now. But we look forward to hearing about your successes. I hope this presentation has been a benefit to you. It's been a pleasure to deliver it to you. And Andrea, I'll turn it back to you for some additional information. Great, thank you. I'm gonna, um, Marion just mentioned the help desk. We're gonna stay online. Um, we're um, close to time. So we will stay a little bit longer if folks wanna stay on and hang around and listen um, to all of our questions. But in the chat box, I went ahead and put our help desk. Um, there are a number of you that ask very garden specific questions. Um, if we don't get to those specific questions tonight, um, I've posted their help desk phone number and email address. Um, where you could uh, reach out to them with your specific questions and we encourage you to do that. Um, if we go to the next slide, we just want to really thank um, the Contra Costa Library for um, co-hosting this event and marketing it. They put a lot of heart and soul along with us into this and specifically two librarians, Allison Peters from El Cerrito and Chris Gray from the Lafayette Library, who have been really great partners with us in getting this program launched and to everyone here today. Um, we have our last but not least poll, and then I'm just gonna get into questions and giving you a link that you could click on um, to complete a survey while we go through um, our final question round. So our third question is about what additional topics you're interested in. We wanna hear from you. Um, we have a bunch of different topics that are listed here. Um, Zoom um, tells us, hopefully this works, that all you should be able to check all that you're interested in. So um, take a look at our different topics that we have here, and we love to hear from you. Um, go ahead and let us know what you're interested in. Um, we're working, we have several other um, upcoming webinars. We have um, a number of you have posted questions about bugs in your garden. Um, on August 17th, we'll be offering another um, or excuse me, on uh, September 20th, we'll have a good bug, bad bug webinar. And we have two August webinars as well. One, what, wrong, what went wrong in my summer garden? And a lot of you have specific questions you've posted about that. And we'll be doing one on the 30th on Mediterranean climate and plants. But we wanna know what else you're interested in. Um, these other three talks that I mentioned, um, we will be posting the registration information and links a couple weeks before those dates. So keep an eye out on our Facebook pages and the library's Facebook pages and websites where you could find that. Okay, we have got most folks. I'm gonna give a few more seconds um, for the poll and then I'm gonna end it so we can have plenty of time for questions. Okay. So I'll share the results with you guys. So it looks like um, quite a few people wanna learn more about container and raised beds. Um, Garden, um, garden care, um, about a third. Um, the other big hitters are propagation and pests. And so again, we have a pest um, session coming up um, on September 20th, we're co-hosting with the library. Um, and quite a few wanna know on um, integrated pest management and a lot more about soil, which we talked quite a bit today. So great. I'm gonna um, stop sharing these results. And I am going to go ahead and get into the last part of our, um, if we could advance the slide.
I'm trying. Sure. Yeah. That's fine. So um, feedback is very important to us. Um, we would love to learn um, more about what you thought about today's presentation um, so that we could do better. Um, I am posting, I'm going to be posting um, a link. Again, it's a two minute uh, survey that is um, on SurveyMonkey. Um, and then also um, by going onto this link, um, we'll ask for your email address and we'll be able to send you the handout um, that Marianne referenced. There's a lot of great links on um, vegetable planning guides for central county and coastal regions, um, lots about water and soil and compost. Um, uh, so I really encourage you um, to share that information. We'd love to share that handout with you. Um, additionally, the UC offices will be sending a survey in 90 days. So keep an eye out from that. That is, um, there. That uh, both of these surveys are voluntary, of course. Um, the UC survey really wants to measure the success of our programs. How are we doing at helping you as homeowners with your home gardening needs? So um, we really would value you, um, and again, it's voluntary, completing our um, survey monkey today, and then keeping an eye out and clicking on that link that the UC offices send, um, send in 90 days. And so, Marion, let's get to questions. We have quite a few. Um, I'm hoping that we're going to be able to get to all of them today. Um, so I'm going to go with kind of the ones that I hear the most, um, that I'm seeing the most kind of questions on. Here's a really good question. Um, we'll go back. I think we're on soil. Is potting mix the same as soil? And if I am using potting mix for my garden, should I be adding anything to it? Good question. Potting mix generally is not the same thing as soil. So our soil definition is mostly minerals with some uh, water, air, and organic matter in it, yay. But potting mix usually has additional things in it to make it lighter because soil in ground, native soil, tends to be a lot heavier. And if we put that into pots, it's gonna be too heavy. It may not have enough drainage for the plant. So potting mix, or um, I guess it's usually potting mix, is generally going to be lighter and fluffier, and it's designed to go into containers, into pots, where drainage is critical. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, let's see. The next question is, how do I create more air in my soil? Compost, compost, compost. <laughs> mulch, mulch, mulch. Um, compost is actually a really good way to do it. There are a couple of other options, uh, but they require maybe some special tools that are not common in the average gardener's tool shed, like a broad fork, which is a pretty heavy, big, uh, it's basically a fork you stand on so that you can put it down into the air uh, put it down into the soil and those really sharp tines, I think they're like 10 or 12 of them, will just go straight down and then you pull it out and you can either put compost in those holes or you can just water it in and that helps get um, uh, uh, air in. Another option is, I'm going to go back up to the tools. The uh, third tool from the top, that, that's called a spading fork. That is an option. You can go through and just poke into your soil that will add some air in there. But generally compost, the lighter you can make the, the soil, uh, uh, comp actually microbes, if you've got a lot of microbes in your soil, those, those bacteria and the fungi and the protozoas and all those guys, the more you have in the soil, the, and the more earthworms you have in your soil, the lighter and the more air you'll have in your soil. Great, thank you. Um, one, um, in one person asked, why is it not good to water late in the day? Generally, it has to do with, and again, um, other master gardeners out there, if uh, you've got something in addition to this, I am so willing to uh, make sure that our audience gets the best information possible. You want your leaves as dry as you can, as you can have them as we go into nightfall. Yeah, there's going to be some dew maybe coming on, but like one of the tips for tomatoes is if you can plant your tomatoes so that the morning sun gets to them as soon as possible to dry off the leaves, that some of the vegetables, some of the plants are more susceptible to fungal diseases on the leaves, and the drier we keep them, 
the better off we're going to be. So again, just water at soil level. And especially if you're using like drip irrigation, it's not going to get your leaves wet anyway. That said, there are, there's a lot of mite, M-I-T-E problems going on uh, that I'm noticing in the gardens that I'm familiar with. And mites, spider mites, red spider mites, if you notice the stippling or your formerly deep green leaves started to, they're starting to get like white. It looks like maybe nutrition's being sucked out of the leaves. It is. They thrive in really dry conditions. So I'm finding that one of the ways that I'm controlling my mite issue is I need to actually spray down the leaves, but I'm doing it earlier in the day. Great, thank you. And I have a correction to make on something I said. I posted the help desk phone number and email. Um, with Shelter in Place, we're currently uh, responding to emails only right now. So um, please use that um, email address that's in there. Thank you for those who uh, kept me in line. Appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> okay, so one um, participant said, you know, she worries about putting compost directly on our soil when she finds earwigs, centipedes, and other friends in there. So she's been leaving it in the sun in a wheelbarrow and wonders, is this wrong or should she put the compost on when it's wet with all those critters in it directly on the soil? Those critters are a mixed blessing. The earwigs are decomposers. They do eat aphids. They do eat mites. And yes, they will also eat your plant leaves. So it's a mixed bag, but I personally would be more interested in you getting your compost on your garden when it's still moist. And so, because if you're leaving it out in the wheelbarrow, of course it's loose, air's not a problem, but the water, the moisture would be. So if the critters don't have the water that they need, they will no longer be there, they'll die. So um, I would go ahead and work it into your garden. And there are, oh, um, UC has some good pest notes on how to handle earwigs and some of the more common uh, pests. But go ahead, I, I, I'm more interested in getting your soil healthy through adding compost to it. Great, okay, thank you. Um, another question that came in um, regarding raised beds. What should be put in that, potting soil or garden soil? Wow, um, that question brings up the answer to about 75% of all gardening questions. And the answer is, it depends. It depends on how deep the bed is. It depends on what the shape of the native soil is. Ay, ay, ay. Um, when we started here at home, we had to do a lot of terracing and we were on solid sandstone and we actually ended up bringing in soil. And they're all different types of soil. There's top soil, there's, uh, there's vegetable, there's, um, oh God, I, I know I'm not supposed to recommend any particular brand, so I'm trying to figure out how to describe it. There are various grades and weights of soil. So if I were filling a raised bed and it were, um, I'd say 12 to 18 inches tall. Depending on the quality of my native soil, I would use that and I would probably also bring in some soil amendment. And it will say on the bag, amendment. Amendment is different than potting mix and it's different than topsoil. It will say things probably like fir bark and um, it'll have a lot of ingredients in there, but that's sort of an inter, uh, it's in between potting mix, which is really light and fluffy, and garden soil, which tends to be fairly heavy. Okay, great, thank you. What, um, regarding, here's a, a question somebody said, they have a lot of magnolia trees in their yard, and I guess this question might be the same with oak trees. They take forever to decompose. Um, can I use them for mulch? Yes, yeah, I think so. I actually have never worked with magnolias, but we do have a fair amount of oak trees. And I do use those leaves. I basically just let them fall where they, where they may, but you're right. They take a very long time to decompose. Um, one thing I will mention that you may not want to use as mulch, either for wood chips or for uh, mulch, is walnut. Walnut trees are a little apathic, meaning they're going to be... Uh, 
they give off a substance called juggalone that inhibits growth. So if you are trying to grow vegetables close to a walnut tree and you're not having a lot of success, know that it may be the juggalone in the soil that's causing the issue. But I guess if you wanted to put um, walnut chips in a walkway to inhibit weeds, I guess that that might possibly work. But just be aware that any of your allelopathic plants, and walnut is a fairly common one around here, that it's going to inhibit your uh, pl the plants you want to grow from growing. Perfect. Okay, I know I just want to um, acknowledge, I know we're about five, six minutes over. Um, we have about three or four more questions. We'll stay on the line to answer those. We know some of you may leave. Um, so if, if you have to leave, I just wanna thank you for, and I, we hope to see you again. Um, and if you've taken time for the survey, we thank you for that. Um, but for those who are able to have a little bit more time, we're, we're gonna stay on and go through a couple more questions. Um, so somebody asked a question about rototillering as an option. What are some things that um, they're wondering they could do, say, a month before? Is there anything that they could layer um, before planting instead of rototillering? Absolutely. Get some compost if you can. So first of all, clear the area. I don't know what you, you have on your land right now, but if, if it's a lawn, uh, cut the grass down as short as you can. Put some compost down, half inch if you've got it. Put down some cardboard, big pieces. Uh, if you go to the appliance stores or sometimes the moving companies have uh, lots of big boxes left over. And if you can put some wood chips on top of the cardboard, water it in um, as frequently as you can because you want a lot of moisture going into the soil. Earthworms love cardboard. And they will, they will come into that area and they will start chewing and eating the, the, the soil. They'll, they'll start aerating the soil for you. What we did when we first started Rogers Ranch, because we had that adobe clay soil, we did this exact process and we ended up planting straight through the cardboard. So after a month had passed, we figured out where we wanted to put the plants and we just dug out holes in the cardboard and we're fairly impressed that we were indeed able to get into some friable soil at that point. So that actually works fairly well. And the, also the advantage of covering with the compost, the cardboard and the wood chips, great weed suppression. Great, okay, thank you. Um, and uh, Master Gardener did call out that ground up magnolia leaves are fine to use. I'm um, going back Good. to the prior question. Yeah, so there's an answer to that. If you. the person who asked is still on. Thank you for that. Um, somebody asked the question, what does it mean to compost manure? Excellent question. Because a lot of people will confuse manure and compost. So compost is the decomposition of organic materials. And what we're really going for is the aerobic decomposition of organic materials. Manure is a very high source of nitrogen. That's one of the four elements of compost. The manure is going to need to be added to the carbon, the browns, with the water and the air so that all of, those, all of the manure can get broken down. So that if there are some bad parts of um, some chemicals in the manure, if you've got the other elements working with you, especially if you're doing something called thermophilic composting, which means you're getting it hot, then that can help tremendously. So manure can be a part of compost, but manure is not compost. Great. Okay. I think this is the last one. And while you answer, I'm going to double check. Uh, somebody was asking if you could elaborate why hybrids are less attractive to bees than open pollinated plants. They don't have the nutritional load. So what happens with the hybrid, as I understand it, is you take the pollen from one plant and you take a pollen from a different plant, a different named plant. It's, it's not the same fam. It's not the same, oh gosh. Um, oh, it, they, they, you've got a mama plant and you've got a daddy plant and they're not the same plant. And you fertilize the, uh, a flower so that when it turns into a fruit and the, the seeds you have there 
are gonna go like a Sun Gold tomato is probably one of the most famous hybrids and tasty hybrids we have. You can't take the seeds of a Sun Gold tomato and plant them and expect to get another Sun Gold tomato out of it. Um, but in terms of the why you don't want a hybrid flower for pollinators, the nutritional load isn't there. It doesn't have, it looks like pollen, it may look like nectar, but it's not chemically act, is as active as an open pollinated flower at my current level of understanding. So I'm always learning something new. And again, if any master gardeners out there have more experience within the hybrid realm, but what I learned was it's fine to plant hybrids. There are really good reasons to have them, but if you are doing it for pollinators, make sure it's open pollinated. Great. Okay, I think, so we're about um, 10 minutes, 11 minutes over. I think we're gonna stop there. And thank you All so right. much, Marian. Um, and thank you everyone for joined, uh, joining us. Um, I'm just gonna post the survey and our um, help desk email address um, one more time. So it's at the bottom um, of your chat screen and we'll keep this up online. So if you wanna stay and click on it for a while, you'll have that. Um, and again, if you, if there are some specific questions we didn't have time to this evening, go ahead and email our help desk. Um, there's a group of very qualified folks who can research and uh, respond to you on your questions. And again, we hope to see you back again. This, um, this session will be posted soon on our Master Gardener Contra Costa County YouTube channel. Um, we'll have that link up on our Facebook page and the library's Facebook page this week. Um, and keep a lookout at both locations and our websites for um, those upcoming talks that we have in August and September. And thank you so much. Thank you, Marian. Thank you. Pleasure. Bye-bye.